joining you here from Toronto, the traditional land of the Huron, Bandad, the Seneca, and the most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. As a planetary scientist and an educator, my responsibility towards the Indigenous people is to learn about the Indigenous knowledge and make space for Indigenous teachings. As someone who lives in Toronto and the Greater Lakes region, um, I take responsibility to be a good steward for taking good care of the land that I inhibit. And I'm joining you from Washington, D.C., and want to acknowledge the genocide and forceful displacement of Indigenous communities from and those still connected to this land, including the Piscataway and Pamunkey tribal nations. We recognize, respect, and honor the elders of the Indigenous peoples whose lands and territories were wrongfully stolen from them. I'm also joining you from Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, where President Donald Trump is talking about deploying active military troops onto our streets in an unprecedented moment in our lifetimes that cannot be ignored. We want to acknowledge the ongoing crisis of anti-Black racism associated with police violence in the United States and Canada. Black people have made remarkable contributions to the STEM fields. If people from across the land are coming together as safely as they can in the midst of a pandemic to call for accountability, justice, and reparations from our governments and from police for the violent taking of Black lives and harm done to Black communities. We stand in solidarity. However, expressions of solidarity are meaningless if we do not confront and work to end the anti-Black racism that is deeply rooted in our own communities. And as we reflect on our part in these systems of racism and oppression, we acknowledge our own shortcomings. As scientists, educators, and communicators, we have the privilege, the power, and the responsibility to address racism, bias, and prejudice within ourselves and our conference. We pledge to learn, unlearn, and relearn what we know about racism and oppression, and take real actions to create a more inclusive environment. And we will start this by ensuring that more Black voices are present in our keynotes and our panels in our 2021 conference. So we wanted to make sure that all of this was acknowledged before we dive into the main topic of the conversation tonight, because it just didn't feel right to continue this conversation without acknowledging that we're in the middle of like I said, unprecedented times right now. So with that, this is very emotional. <laughs> Let me share my screen with you. So we're going to have a couple of presentations tonight talking on things focused on personal branding online. Um, it is geared more towards science and STEM, but the lessons that you get here are hopefully more widely applicable to other things that you might be wanting to do online as well. Um, if you have any questions, you should be able to unmute yourself. It was set to mute everybody when you come in just to avoid any issues with people not being muted. Um, feel free to chime in in the middle if you do have a, a question or in the chat box. Um, or if you want to wait until after uh, this first talk is done, feel free. And then Sarah is going to give a second talk and then we'll do some interactive exercises at the end. So science is not as complicated as we make it out to be. I think that we're used to a lot of jargon and a lot of concepts that we think are complicated when we're doing this. But when you break down a lot of what we're doing, it's actually not that difficult. We just don't tend to do a very good job of conveying what we're doing in language that is intelligible outside of our little bubbles. And that could be even just outside your own lab group. If you have folks that are working on, say, exoplanets, the language that they might be using for the stuff that they do day to day is going to be totally different than the stuff that I do day to day as a Mars scientist, for example. So we need to find a better way to communicate across both um, related STEM fields, but also with the general public so that they understand why you're doing what you're doing and why it matters. And one thing that I think is important here is to dispel the mythology of the super genius, as I call it when it comes to science. The myth that scientists have to be geniuses, they have to be really good at math, and that's absolutely not true. I barely passed every math class that I took in college, and I still got to work on Mars rovers, and I want people to understand that that is not something that will shut you out of doing this as a job. And also the idea that having a PhD also makes you a genius. That's also not true. 
um, not to offend anybody else on this call that has a PhD. Uh, it just means that you are incredibly dedicated and hardworking and very focused on the specific subject that you work on. And I want people to realize in the general public that this is the case. Like, we are not unrelatable people. We're just humans that have put a lot of time and effort studying this thing that we're interested in. And it's really not all that different from somebody who has maybe devoted their entire life to understanding how the engines of various Volkswagens work. Social media provides a really great platform for us to be able to talk to people because it's a way to democratize, democratize access to scientific knowledge. It's not something that's hidden behind the gates of paywalls anymore or in classrooms where people might feel excluded. It's a way where you can communicate with other scientists and the public and the media what you're doing and do it in a way where you're controlling that narrative. And so I really like these platforms as a way to do that. And I don't want you to think of it from this talk as just a way to do public outreach. It's a way to help brand yourself in the community and also help publicize what you do in a way that can be beneficial to your career in the long run. The impact of social media can be really significant. It gives you the opportunity to reach a very large and extremely broad audience. So this is an example um, from some Twitter analytics that I captured of just one tweet that I wrote back when Insight landed on Mars a couple of years ago. Just one tweet saying that we had landed on Mars reached almost a million people. And then this map here shows the global distribution of those people that saw that tweet. So in one day, you can reach more people with your message than, I hate to break it to you, will probably read any of the papers that you've ever written or all the papers that you'll ever, papers that you'll ever write in your career, cumulatively speaking. Uh, so if you really want to make an impact, this is a great way to get the word out there. Some of this might be a review for people that are already familiar with social media, but I know some people are maybe more familiar with one platform than another. Um, so just to kind of go over the players in the game and how they are well suited for different types of communication and also maybe your personality in terms of how you want to showcase yourself online. Regardless of what platform you choose, use that and take it to make yourself known for what you do. And there are some really great ways that you can do that. And one of them is as simple as deciding what you're going to be known as online. So these are some examples of people that uh, I felt had really great Twitter handles, which you can also apply to anything else like Snapchat or um, YouTube, Instagram, that really help capture what they do. Um, Sarah, who we have here on the call, she wants to be a science communicator. This is what she does as her career. And so SciComm Sarah tells you right off the bat what she does. Um, Gordon Ozinski, who some of you I, I recognize on the list, maybe some of his students, he uh, has a PhD and works on craters, Dr. Crater. Uh, Jungle Jordan, Jordan Beasley, he is a zookeeper that makes videos about different types of animals. Lately, he's been doing a lot of birds for the Black Birders Week things. Um, so something that makes it quick and easy for people to tell what you work on. You can also pick your name if you want to, but usually some of these handles are quicker and easier to remember than your actual name and they might be cooler than your actual name anyway. So Twitter is a really great resource for topical real-time news. Uh, it's a good news feed that's constantly updated throughout the day. And having that 280 character limit really forces you to think about brevity. And that is fantastic for practicing uh, how to avoid lengthy jargon and distilling your ideas down to the takeaway points. And this is what Sarah is going to be focusing on in on her talk after this. There are really, really effective ways to be able to communicate the things you do in maybe two to three sentences. And I found using Twitter to be a really good way for me to figure out how I could reduce that, especially when the character limit was 140 characters, because you would type things in, hit that limit and think, okay, what words do I have in here in terms of the number of words or maybe the jargon that I'm using to get that character limit down while still conveying the same idea effectively? So even if you don't want to use Twitter necessarily as your platform, I would suggest maybe even practicing writing pitches about what you do in that 280 character limit as practice to figure out how you can distill all of that down. Uh, Twitter also gives you the opportunity to latch onto hashtag movements to bring attention to a particular cause, but don't do it unless it's something that's relevant to you. Don't try to jump onto something just because it's popular or uh, sort of usurp something that belongs to a different community, for example. Um, they're definitely usually taken upon uh, by the community for a specific thing that they're trying to accomplish. 
Um, so don't try to take that if it's not something that's really meant for you. Another great aspect of Twitter is that it's a, it's a place for selective engagement. People can choose if and how they want to engage with you. So you can post something, somebody happens to see it while they're scrolling by and think, oh, this is great, but they keep on going. Somebody can choose to like your tweet to give you a little bit more acknowledgement that it's something that they found interesting. Um, and if they're really interested, they can decide to ask you a question or retweet that piece of knowledge to all of their followers. And I think that this is a really great way to approach this because it's, it's more casual, it's more friendly, it's maybe more intimidating than forcing somebody to like show up to a scientific talk or you know, go to a science museum where somebody might be presenting to ask them a question about something. This way people can figure out how much they want to know or how much more they want to learn from you in this environment. These are some examples of um, tweets that people have posted for different hashtag movements. Um, there have been some really great ones so far. Uh, Actual Living Scientist was a good one uh, a few years ago now where uh, there was a, a survey that had been done of the general public saying that some overwhelming percentage of people had never met an actual living scientist. And so Science Twitter rallied forward to post pictures of scientists in the field doing their work or in the labs doing what they do um, in order to show that Scientists are not just all old white men, they're out there actively doing things um, and really bringing a face to the idea of what it is to be a scientist. Um, Girls with Toys was sort of a similar thing. There was a quote from a male astronomer saying that astronomy was just boys with their toys and Science Twitter rallied behind that to say, no, there are tons of women that are in, in this field doing things like this as well. Um, so this is a really great way to help boost visibility of uh, different subject matters or different things that you might be working on. And it's also a really great way to network with other people that are doing these things related to what you're doing. Um, every time one of these go by, you can click on these hashtags and look at the people that have posted along with that. And I always find it to be a really great way to find more people to follow and, and learn about what they're doing, regardless of whether or not it happens to be space related. If you try to it attracts some active engagement on Twitter. You can do that in a way that's also a little bit of subversive marketing for yourself. So have something out there that is related to what you do. Um, a few years ago, I posted a picture like this. Uh, one like equals one Mars fact with my handle on it so that people could see where it came from in case it floated around somewhere else and people wanted to come back and figure out, okay, where can I go to ask this question? Um, this ended up with over three and a half thousand likes. So I am very far behind on the list of facts. But this could easily be done for anything. If you want to do facts about galaxies or you want to do facts about the space mission that you work on or um, the field that you're in in general, uh, I could see this was something that resonated with people really well. So it's a way that not only gets people asking you questions, but it's a little bit of marketing in terms of like, oh, when somebody is looking for an expert in the moon, they might remember this is something that you did on social media and they'll try to find you later. Or if a media person posts on Twitter saying that they're looking for somebody that's an expert in extrasolar planets. Someone might see that and think, oh, I saw that this woman did uh, an AMA and ask me anything or something like this about, about exoplanets. I'm going to refer this journalist to them. Um, and that, that actually happens quite frequently. So it's, it's a really good way to, to get your name out there like that. Um, some tips for Twitter. Uh, un avoid unnecessary jargon. That applies anywhere at any time. Think about the words that you're using and if it's not a word that say your grandmother or maybe your 10 year old would understand, think about whether it's really necessary to convey the point that you're trying to make. And if it's not, what word could you use instead to still get that same point across? Um, another one that we always fall into, especially in the space industry, is to avoid acronyms. I think people are familiar with stuff like NASA, um, but even in space educated audiences like general enthusiasts, I've run into people that are not familiar with even JPL, for example. Um, so thinking about, again, how can you convey these things? How can you make sure that you don't use acronyms? Or at least if you do, define it at the beginning. So if you're giving a talk and then you keep using it from there. Um, sometimes people on Twitter will put like a ton of hashtags at the end of a tweet. Uh, then it starts to look like spam and people kind of ignore all that anyway. So it's generally recommended to not do that. Just pick one or two that are relevant to what you're doing or don't use any at all. You don't have to use them, but it can be useful if you're, if you're tacking onto these movements like I mentioned before. And giving relatable real world examples that are tailored to your audience can be really helpful as well. 
um, so since I gave a lot of presentations in Canada, for example, um, this is a figure that I like to use to help explain how tall Mount Sharp is in Gale Crater where Curiosity is driving around. If you say this mountain is 5.5 kilometers tall, I think we all have a general idea that that is very large, um, but how large is that? Uh, I used to show the graphic here with just the mountains on it. Um, this is before Mount McKinley got officially renamed. The graphic is old, so I, I need to update it. Um, but showing it in terms of CN towers was a little bit more useful. Uh, most people in Canada have some idea of how tall the CN tower is. Even if they don't know how tall it is in, say, meters, they have an idea of, oh, if I'm standing at the base of that, that's really tall. So if I'm standing at the base of 10 of those, this mountain is really tall. And then you get the perspective of, wow, we are driving a rover up a mountain that's this tall on Mars. And it helps you know, make it a little bit more conceivable to somebody here on Earth. So just some examples of how to avoid jargon. Uh, if, instead of seismic activity, think about just saying earthquakes. Uh, on Mars, we tend to use evaporites and phyllosilicates a lot. Just say salts and clays. That's something much more easy for people to understand. Um, use reflective spectroscopy. This comes up a lot on Mars too. Just say, we analyze light bouncing off of rocks and it tells us what they're made out of. Same idea, you don't really have to go into the details unless somebody takes the initiative to ask you, well, how does that actually work? Like, how does light reflecting off of rocks tell us what it's made out of? Then you can jump in and say, that's a great question. Start getting into the nitty gritty details. And I think my captions are covering up the bottom, but instead of just saying dinosaurs, you can say breaking dinosaurs because dinosaurs are really cool. Instagram is really great for showcasing gorgeous photos of your work. So if you're doing stuff like working with uh, say Hubble imagery or um, really gorgeous field sites, if you're a geologist or you work in an engineering lab where you can take photos, I know a lot of times that's not allowed, um, but it's a great place to showcase stuff like that. Um, Instagram has a feature called Instagram Stories where you can post these little bite-sized videos which are good for engagement where you can intersperse you know, fun gifts and factoids and it's something that people can just sort of quickly scroll through, um, you know, casually, like while they're waiting for their food in the microwave or something like that. So it's good for really short, fun pieces of information. Um, but other than having that Instagram live engagement, it's not really a great tool for engagement in terms of being able to have a dialogue with the people that are on it. Because generally, I don't think people even tend to read the captions on the images very much. It's very much a scrolling, you see something you like, you like it, and you keep going. Um, and it's Twitter itself is ephemeral, but I would say Instagram is even more ephemeral than Twitter because you don't necessarily have these search functions or threads that are going on or ways to pull up these older images. Um, so just something to consider if you want to think about the, the permanence or the long-livedness of the things that you're posting online. Um, this I thought was a really great example of Instagram store use from Bobak, Ferda Bobak Ferdowsi, who is also known as Mohawk Guy at JPL. Um, just a little video of his here. So he gave a recap at the end of 2018, just showing all the different missions that we had sent, uh, not just to other planets, I guess, but around Earth as well, giving sort of the year-end recap. And again, you just click through to go through all of these things, and uh, I think it's, it's a great way for people to get bite-sized pieces of information, but they don't necessarily engage with you on that. You might get some people asking questions, but it doesn't tend to be in the same way that Twitter does. Snapchat, maybe I'm old, I don't know how many people still use this anymore, <laughs> but uh, it's again really great for showcasing sort of fun short things like Instagram is with these bite-sized pieces of engagement, but again it's not a really great tool in terms of being able to have a dialogue with anybody, so if you want to have just sort of putting information out there but not having a conversation with people, it's a good way to do that. So maybe you don't want to necessarily interact with people very much. Maybe it's not something that you're socially comfortable with. This is, this is maybe a good tool to do that, this or Instagram. Um, NASA has uh, tried to utilize this a little bit. Um, they do these NASA Snapchats of a day in space. So a little while ago, they were posting pictures of what the astronauts do on the space station. And, and these are pretty fun little things, again, just to see what's going on in space right now. They've also done some Snapchat live shows, uh, and then you can join in, see facts, send in questions, stuff like that. I don't know how many of these they still do, uh, but you can do stuff like this across different platforms as well. Facebook, I would say, is not a great platform for any science communication or real engagement, maybe beyond just talking to your existing friends and family who might be interested in what you do. Just because of the way that Facebook's algorithms have changed, 
and what and how users actually see things in their feeds. So if you tried to make um, a public facing page, for example, that's not just your profile, but like a public page to interact with people that you don't necessarily know, things tend to get so buried with the algorithms that it might not ever actually show up in anyone's feeds. And you could have a thousand people following you and maybe two of them will ever see what you post. So it's not something that I would suggest devoting a lot of time to if you're trying to make some kind of brand online. Um, it's really good for personal networking, less so professionally. So use this to share your cat pictures with your 5,000 friends, but I wouldn't focus on it for any type of science communication or sort of a career building stuff for putting your presence online. YouTube can be a really good platform um, if you have a good camera setup, a really good on-screen presence, um, some kind of premise that you want to make videos about, and uh, you either have really good production value or you just really own your poor production value because that is very uh, endearing for a lot of people. Um, if you want to do something like that, then YouTube might be the right venue for you. Um, and effective science communication on YouTube ranges from being silly to serious and incredibly lo-fi to incredibly polished. And some examples of people that have managed to do this really well, uh, Tim Dodd, who goes by Everyday Astronaut on YouTube, um, he is not a space person per se in terms of the field that he works in. He's a photographer, uh, but he decided to buy uh, a spacesuit and started making videos about human spaceflight, um, posted them online, and now he has over 16 million views across all of his YouTube videos, and he gets invited to SpaceX, SpaceX launches to cover them live as sort of the official, unofficial um, news anchor when these things are going on, or some of the tests that he's doing at Boca Chica lately. You can see his production value is pretty high, like he puts a lot of work into this stuff as a professional photographer. Uh, Amy shared a title. She focuses on sort of the good old days of human space flight, so um, a lot of like Apollo, Gemini, Mercury kind of things, um, and her aesthetic goes all along with that. And she's got about 30 million views across all of her, her different videos on YouTube. Um, she is a historian by trade who happens to be interested specifically in space history, but other things of that era as well. And her production value is sort of like uh, in the middle. She's not trying to go like all out toward what someone like Everyday Astronaut is doing, um, but she's still doing incredibly well in terms of communicating her point across to people because she's established this very clear brand of who she is and what she does. And now whenever you think of sort of vintage space flight, like human space flight, she's, she'll be one of the first names that comes to mind for a lot of people that are online. Um, Paul Shalito, he goes by Curious Droid on YouTube. He's also not a space person, he's a videographer with a background in computer science um, who started doing very, um, really polished videos that kind of feel like something you might be watching on the BBC. He's got 94 million views across all of these videos. Um, he has, his signature is he's, his patterned shirts. He always has a very flamboyant shirt on in every video that he does. So again, it's a memorable thing that makes people think of you and the things that you specialize in it can be really helpful when you're trying to brand yourself online. So what are the things you could share on social media to make it relevant to what you're doing as a scientist or an engineer or somebody working in space? You can share your own knowledge of your field. So uh, things that you've learned along the way, any cool facts that you might have, um, the stuff that you're working on. You can microblog events. That's become a really big thing at conferences. So just sharing the things that are going on there. That's not just helpful for the general public seeing what's going on, but it can be helpful for other people at the conference who are not necessarily in the same session that you're in, or maybe you were posting about talk that they didn't make it to. Um, it's, it's a good way to engage with all of those communities. You can also do a lot of behind the scenes stuff, like I mentioned before. So share pictures of your lab, share pictures of your field work, um, share pictures of the funny things and the failures, like help humanize science and engineering and show that we're just people. Um, you don't necessarily have to do that if you want to keep it extremely professional and you, you don't want to share something like, oh, that one time the, the tire on your truck exploded during field school, which I'm sure all the geologists on the call have had that happen before. Um, but it's just something that makes things more relatable for people and uh, a little bit more memorable. And then personal engagement. So if it's something where you feel like sharing your story about how you got into the position that you're in, um, especially for any women or other marginalized people in STEM, any barriers that you might have run into, um, any advice that you have for people coming up so they can either uh, have an easier time or you can help them avoid some of those barriers or make, just to make things better for the community in the long run. Um, that can be a really great way, again, to humanize things and show that there are people out there that care they want to make the community more welcoming and inviting, 
they want to give advice to people, um, and they want to see everybody that wants to be part of this be a part of it. Um, I've chosen to do this by engaging through people, uh, with people through uh, a disability that I have. I have a disease called ankylosing spondylitis, and so um, this is not a common condition, so a lot of people have not heard of it. And I, I go, go to the doctor and I still have to spell it for nurses a lot of the time. Um, and it's been a way to help engage people with seeing that even if you have a chronic illness or a disability, you can still become a scientist. Um, it's definitely an incredible, incredibly personal thing to decide to share. And so, you know, I'm not telling everybody to go out and share every intimate detail of your life, but it's something, if it's something that you feel like is worth sharing about your story and has affected your career path in some way that you think it would be impactful to share with people or help them feel like this is something that they can actually do. Um, it's another thing to consider. And I've, I've had other scientists with disabilities reach out to me because of these things to talk about their own struggles, even if it's something that they're not necessarily open about within the community or you know beyond maybe their lab group. And they don't even necessarily want to talk about it publicly on social media, but they've found it comforting to see that there's a person that is going through the same stuff that they're going through. And so there's another avenue of sort of networking in that, that aspect as well. Um, just to kind of give you an idea to emphasize that this is not just uh, networking for the sake of putting stuff out there for the general public. Um, I wanted to share some of the things that have come my way professionally because of social media, like 100% because of social media, I guess combined with having a background in this stuff. Um, but it can be very beneficial for you personally. Um, I've been asked to write articles for magazines and newspapers because either journalists were following me on Twitter or like I mentioned before, somebody seeing a journalist looking for someone that's specializing in something and other people chiming in and saying, oh, I know someone that works on that. That happens quite frequently. And so that's where making yourself known for what you do and people thinking of you as a person that is approachable in that specific subject can help benefit you professionally. Because maybe you're putting out these, these types of publications, it's not something that's going on your CV, like it's, it's, it's not a, a peer reviewed publication, but it is something that gets your name out there in front of other people that could be beneficial to you down the line. Um, just opening up a lot of doors. And so try to think of it as a way that you are marketing yourself to the public, to the media, but also to people that might be your potential collaborators down the line or your potential employers. This, this is just an example of some of the things that came my way through social media and I'm incredibly thankful for all of these things. And I know that I've seen lots of other people get things like um, internship opportunities or they find out about scholarship opportunities through Twitter and you know somebody sees a scholarship that applies to um, you know women in STEM or uh, black women in computer science or uh, you know things like that. They'll think of you and send these things your way. And so it's uh, again a really great networking tool for having the way to find these things and find the people that they might be good fits for. Another good tip is to make sure that you have a website of some kind. This is where you can really hone sort of your professional or academic or industry presence, whatever you're going for. Um, maybe you already have a website that's sitting on your university server, like if you're a faculty member, um, or you maybe have a profile page for the company that you work for. But if you want to try and set up something that's your own brand identity, where you're, again, you're controlling that narrative, Having a website with uh, you know, an easy to remember address, like your name, or if you want to use that handle that you're using on social media, use that for your website addresses too. This is where you can dump things like your blog, your CV, um, and anything else that you want to store on there. Uh, this has also been a, another really effective way for people to find you because if they're looking for somebody that's an expert in certain things, uh, journalists or students that are looking for graduate advisors, for example, might just Google these things and then they'll find you through your website. I've had more than a few students contact me through my website looking to do um, graduate work in Mars. Unfortunately, now that I no longer work at the university, I always feel bad when I have to tell them no. But the biggest advice that I can leave you with over all of these platforms when you're thinking about how to present yourself, be proactive, go out and look for these opportunities that might be out there. Um, some people might send things your way, but being proactive to actually look for them definitely makes things easier. Be genuine. I'm sure like you guys are all in this because you love space and it's something that we're all really enthusiastic about and let that shine through. That, that genuineness really resonates with people, whether they are another space professional or uh, you know, a teenager just browsing Twitter on their computer or somebody that is a parent of a child who's excited about space. 
it, it's something that really gets them excited about all of this stuff. And so be genuine and be enthusiastic and sh show people why you chose to do this as your career. Why do you love this? And why should they love it? Why should they care? Why should they be supporting science? Why should they be supporting the fact that government money goes toward this so that we can help people understand? We, we're working on this to benefit human knowledge. I think that's, all, that's why all of us are here. But if we're not doing a job of communicating that and what we're learning, then what's the point? What, what is the point of us doing this at all? So with that, um, if anybody has any questions on this part before I move on to Sarah's, uh, let me stop my screen sharing. I can figure out how to stop my screen sharing. Um, there's a question in the chat box about what your options are on LinkedIn. That's a good question. So I don't use LinkedIn extensively, but there are a lot of places that do. Um, there we go, stop sharing. So LinkedIn is a really great platform if you want to have like an extremely professional uh, appearance. So this is basically where you want to take your CV and put it in uh, a visually pleasing form in the form of LinkedIn. Um, share any news stories that are related to things that you're working on, like if um, your university or company has put out a press release about something that you've done. Um, if you got a promotion at work, you can post things like that. You can get people who know you to endorse you for skills on LinkedIn, and so um, that will come in handy as well. I think a lot of people think of LinkedIn as this thing that exists, but no one actually uses, so they don't necessarily see the utility, but there are definitely industry people that go through it to headhunt people to look for um, people for specific job opportunities. The company that I work for looks for a lot of um, software people, for example, from what I've been told on LinkedIn. Um, I got a job with Honeywell Aerospace based on them finding me on LinkedIn. So uh, it's, it's something worth having a profile on, uh, but keeping it extremely professional because that's where the people are going to be looking for you to collaborate or ask you about jobs at your company or your university, or again, potentially students that are looking to work with you. Um, so yeah, sh sharing really professional things like that. Uh, let's see, I see Megan had the same question. Um, Alyssa, how much time would you say your branding work takes per week? Do you have any advice on the challenges beginners will face when starting out? It could take a lot of time. I mean, it definitely took years to build up to a point where my name became recognizable to people when, in terms of thinking about Mars. So it's not something that will happen overnight. But the more you put yourself out there, the easier it is for people to find you. So. Um, it depends on what platform you're using. Like Twitter is really useful if you're posting stuff a few times a day. Um, Instagram, you could probably post like one thing a day or one story a day. LinkedIn is the kind of thing where maybe if you do a few things a week, it, it would still be engaging enough that people notice. Um, the challenges that you would face are definitely, there are a lot of people on all of these platforms. And that's where honing in on your specific expertise can really come in handy. Like just say that you're a space person, there's a ton of people that are in space. I mean, we have 62 people on this call that are space people. At least I think almost everybody here is a space person. Um, so what is it specifically that you do in space that is useful? So like Sarah, for example, you do science communication and you specialize in the moon. Like that suddenly makes you much more focused than just saying you work about things all in space. Um, or like I see Emily on here, Emily Carney. You are like all the, all the vintage space awesomeness and like I don't know a whole lot about the stuff that you work on and like you have carved out a niche in that. So when people think about that or like they think about space hipster, hipsters, like your face is on my screen, so that's why I picked you. <laughs> you know, you're the person that comes to mind. So think about that. What is the specific thing that you bring to the table? Um, branding people call this your unique selling proposition, which sounds very corporate. Um, but think about that. What is it that you have that no one else does or that you do that maybe not very many people do or people aren't doing on social media? And then really, really focus in on that and then promote the heck out of it. Just post as much as you can and make sure you're posting really interesting and engaging things across all of these platforms so that people start thinking about you when they think of that subject. Um, let's see, Kristen says, when I started my Twitter account, I planned just to use it for fun, but it's become mostly science related. I would have picked a different handle if I'd known I would use it this way. Does anyone know how changing your handle affects old tweets? Um, 
as far as I know, it shouldn't affect anything. People can still find you. Um, and I, I have friends that have changed their handles before. Um, so it shouldn't cause you any problems. The only thing would be like if people have remembered you as one thing, just training them to think of the new one. Uh, but yeah, I would say don't be afraid to change your name if, if it's something that you want to make sound more professional or more fun or um, less unprofessional if it was something that was chosen to be fun, something like that. Okay, I'm going to hand the host privileges over to Sarah. I hope I find you in the list over here. Oh, there we go. Okay, you should be able to share your screen now. Okay, perfect. Awesome. So um, if you do have a piece of paper and pen handy, I would say um, grab it. If not, if you have your computer, uh, it might work. I'm also going to drop a, um, if I can, drop something in the chat box. Um, actually, I'll do it right after. Um, I wanted to add a resource, but I'll bring it in after, um, after my part so that you can have that option with you. Um, so I just wanted to talk quickly about drafting um, an elevator pitch. Let's say you're literally stuck in an elevator with someone or you're at a conference and you're writing the elevators down. Um, if you're a student and you're um, presenting a poster at a conference, you could really use that as your hook when somebody stops by your poster. Uh, but also we're, we might, uh, we're hoping to have a networking event uh, in a couple of months and that might be something that's useful if you're either looking for a job, looking for a PhD advisor, postdoc advisor, um, you can really take this and um, change it to be in any way that you that you want it to be. Um, so I'll go over the steps and maybe I'll take a quick pause at every step to give everybody a chance to uh, draft what they might want to do and feel free to change it up depending on who your target audience is. And speaking of target audiences, so I just learned about the message box um, actually a few months ago. Um, there's different ways when you want to start thinking about the message that you want to send across. I'll, I'll include the link that's on this, this screen in the chat box so you can have access to it later. There's a lot of great um, sort of workbooks that you can go through. But the message box is really nice when you want to talk to media, for example. Uh, to the media or you want to give a general public talk or you want to t give a research talk. It's really about focusing on what the message that you want to give is and then going on into more details. And it always starts with your audience. So who is your audience? What's really important? What amount of details would you want to start with? And then it starts with sort of the core of the message box, which is the issue. And it's talking about the broader issue at hand. Um, so in general, what does your topic pertain to? And I'll stick to my own field of research uh, for the examples that I'm giving, but feel free to change it around. So my, for my PhD, I studied cratering rate on the moon, but in general, and the issue in general, if I wanted to get at would be, you know, what's been happening to the earth and the moon in the past. And then the problem starting from the top would be the specific issue that you wanna address. So for me would be that cratering rate. And then on the right hand side, so you sort of do a clockwise um, spin is the so what. The so what might not be as critical or as important if you're talking to someone in your field, if, uh, you know, if you're looking for an advisor who's working in a similar field to you, that might not be that important. You don't need to convince them about the so what, but if you're talking to the media, if you're talking to somebody who's you know, stopped by your poster out of the 500 posters that are around you, you really want to get the message across of why should they care? Why should they stop by here? Or why should they care about your message? What's, what's in it for them? Why should they care? I get excited about the moon, but half of the world population probably doesn't. So it's my job to convince them of why they should care about it. And then the solution, what is, what is the answer that I've come up with in answering the problem that I proposed at the beginning? Same thing when you're 
presenting your poster. This is the question I was trying to answer. This is the answer I've come up with. And then the benefits. So how does this benefit? This is coming back to the so what again. How does that bring up new questions or where would you take this further? Uh, you know, why should this person hire you on to work with them? What skills do you have? That all that all fi falls within um, the benefits of it. So I'll share this later on so that, you know, if you're working on something, it's, it's got a lot of great resources. But drafting an elevator pitch, and before I get too much into this, I wanted to give credit to Dr. Prashadi Patel. I think she's on the line as well. So the elevator pitch model, this format was actually created in collaboration with her. An elevator pitch, think about it as having, you know, 30 seconds or 60 seconds of someone's time before they start to think about all the other things that they have going on on their brain. And it's got two key elements. Who's your audience and how much time do you have? So for a networking event, I would say, you know, just bet on the fact that you have maybe 30 or 60 seconds before, you know, somebody comes in with um, some finger foods or they start thinking about all the other work that they have to do. So really getting your message across as, in, as quickly as possible. It has to be short and to the point, but also grab someone's attention. So if you're literally writing down an elevator with someone, it should be engaging enough that when the elevators, when the elevator doors open, they don't want to just run away, you know, say, I'm really busy, talk to you later. They actually want to stand around and ask you more questions. So it's sort of like an invitation to, okay, ask me more questions. Let's get into more details. And we'll do it in four different steps. So the first step is a quick introduction. This really applies, you know, to presenting a poster, to um, talking about your research, or even, you know, trying to network and um, sort of look for a job. So who are you and uh, what is your research question? I'll give an example based on my own research and the way I've drafted my elevator pitch is sort of to get um, um, at a in a, in a scientist group, but maybe to, to a group of people that are not super familiar with my field of study, maybe even a general broad audience of folks in STEM. So for me, I would say something like, um, my name is Sarah, I'm looking at calculating ages for craters on the moon. Knowing more about this can help us understand how often the moon and the earth have been getting bombarded. So maybe what I'll do is go quickly over the four steps and then come back to each step and give you some time to draft yours and then some of you could share your elevator pitch with us. So that would be my quick, my quick intro. Hey, stop by, this is what I'm trying to do. Step two would be any necessary background information and any analogies or imagery work would be great here. Again, if you're talking to someone who is, um, who is in your field of study, then you might not want to go into too much detail about this, but if it's a broader audience, you do want to. And for me, when I was writing this example, this was the part that I had the hardest um, time with of just trying to sort of cut it down so that I can't fit it within the 30 to 60 seconds. So for me, the background information would be when craters form, they produce a lot of rocks. Over about a billion years, rocks get broken down with uh, future impactors and turn into sand. This tells us about their age. So just quickly, not going into too much detail. If, if someone's interested, hopefully they will ask me more about it and I can talk about it then. And step three is the results. What, what have you discussed? How are you working to answer your research question or anything else that you're trying to pitch? And it will go like, so far we found that the rate of bombardment has increased by a factor of two to three in the past 300 million years only looking at the past billion years, both on the moon and the earth. So just a quick result. Again, I could go into a lot more details, but this is not where I wanna do it. And step four would be, what do your results mean? What are the potential benefits of, of, um, of this new knowledge? Um, and my example of it would be, these results indicate that this increase in bombardment is around the same time as the largest extinction event about 250 million years ago. Our work sets the stage for more scientists to explore this issue and see what they can make of it. Again, if I was talking to people that do um, crater studies and planetary studies, I probably wouldn't talk about um, the extinction event. That's more of grabbing uh, the media's attention or the general or the broader public to get them more interested into something that's exciting. Because again, 
a lot of people might not really care about the moon, but they will care about, oh, what's happened to us before? Is it going to happen again? That sort of thing. Um, so these are the four, the four steps that um, I had for an elevator pitch. I'll go back to step one, um, just put up the question and sort of give you a little bit of time to write out your elevator pitch. And we have some time to um, come back together and maybe some of you could share your elevator pitch with us. So again, the first step, introduce yourself. What is your research question? Step two would be any necessary background information. If you want to make any analogies, uh, this would be a great time as well. Step three would be the results. So what have you discovered? Uh, how did you answer the question that you proposed in step one? Or if you haven't come up with an answer yet, what is it that you're um, working on? How are you going, sort of the methodology as well, how are you going to answer that question? And step four is, what do your results mean? Um, what are the potential benefits of this new knowledge? Sort of the next steps, or why should anybody else care? Or why should they take you on to continue um, sort of in that field of study or to ask more questions like that? Or, you know, what is it that you bring to the table? Um, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll put in uh, the message box link in the chat box as well while you're wrapping up your um, elevator pitches. And then if anybody would like to uh, volunteer to read their elevator pitch maybe, or if there's any questions, and then we can also take questions about uh, Tanya's uh, talk as well. Okay, if you've drafted your elevator pitch um, and would like to share it with us, or if you want to sort of do a practice run uh, before the networking event, um, just feel free to unmute yourself and pitch it. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Go ahead. Hi. Hi, I'm Divya. I'm a PhD student. I'm working on uh, developing a control method for chasing a satellite in orbit and capturing it. And uh, the background information is like, suppose if we need to clear the space debris or repair a satellite, so my work will be actually helpful with that. And the results so far is uh, 
we are in the process of development of a control method for the chaser satellite, which can capture the target satellite with minimum onboard resources. And why do my results mean? Uh, it will help in clean the space and make space for new satellites and also help allow dying satellites to survive by servicing it. Thank you. Great, that was awesome. That was really good. Um, I think that opens up, you know, the doors to more questions of, okay, well, what do you mean by it helps with like dying satellites? What, like, what are some examples of um, things that you have done or like what is something more recent that you're working on it? It's very inviting. It gave enough information for me to know what you're doing, but also leave room for me to want more and to be able to ask more questions. Would anyone else like to share their elevator pitch? I can, if that's okay. Yeah. Hi, Julia. Hi. Um, my name is Julia, and I use powerful radio telescopes pointed at the moon to figure out what we look like to an alien observer. I love that. That was great. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. So short and sweet, and you can definitely do it even if you're going down, you know, just 10 floors uh, in an actual elevator, but you come out and you still want to ask more questions and engage in that conversation. All right, anybody else would want to share their elevator pitch? I'll go, that's cool. <laughs> Hi guys, uh, my name is Megan Bennett and I build robots. Uh, I'm a soon to be summer 2020 graduate of Virginia Tech's electrical engineering program um, and I love space. Awesome, this is perfect in, um, you know, especially in an environment that is full of other people that love space because you have now given me something that, you know, even if I don't know, um, you know, much about what you do, I, I found something in common that I can connect with you and I can say, oh my God, I love space too. And then, you know, it just continues and it sort of goes on um, to network as well, more than just trying to, you know, learn about the details of your work. This is great. Awesome. Um, I think we've got about five minutes. So if anybody has any, um, any questions uh, about what Tanya spoke about or what I talked about, uh, feel free to ask, or if anybody else wants to share their elevator pitch, um, feel free to do that. Yes, I'll read a couple of questions um, anonymously that some people sent. Um, one question was, how do you build confidence and feel more comfortable about talking about yourself and your achievements online, especially if you feel self-conscious about feeling like you are bragging? That can be really difficult because we're conditioned not to talk like that. I think especially as women and think of it more as you've worked really hard for all of these accomplishments that you have and all of the expertise that you bring to the table. And you should be proud of that. You should not necessarily you know, try to hide that or be shy. Definitely, it's, it's not good to go out and be conceited about it, but um, be confident in what you have. You know, For the longest time it took me, I felt weird saying Dr. Harrison, because even now it's been years and it still feels weird. Um, but people say, no, if you worked really hard for that, you should use it. And saying that to yourself over and over again, I think helps sink in. You're like, yeah. I know what I'm talking about. I am an expert in this thing that I have spent all this time studying or working on. This is what I do for my job. And I am qualified to speak on this. So definitely don't be afraid of that. And it's, it's easier said than done. We all have imposter syndrome and I don't think it ever actually goes away, even for the people that sound like it has. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind too. It's something that we all are stressed out about all the time. Um, and it just takes time. Hey, hey Tanya. This yeah. is Janet, and it is late in the day, so I'm not turning my camera on. <laughs> but if I can just speak to you guys, I'm probably older than everybody on here. I'm like the grandma. But um, 
currently president of Explore Mars, uh, president of Janet's Planet. I feel like I'm the guardian of the next generation of space explorers. That is my, that is my whole thing. But as far as being the imposter syndrome, probably about 10 years ago, I was standing at a conference and a guy who uh, is very famous, Pat Rawlings, for being a NASA space artist. I was standing there and I don't know what he must have heard me say or probably denigrate myself somehow. And he goes, I'll tell you what you have. And I was like, uh, okay. And he was like, you've got imposter syndrome. He goes, but I saw you with the kids. He goes, when I first started working for NASA, I thought, what am I, what am I doing? An artist, I'm not an engineer. And he goes, but over time, the, the engineers would send me something and they wanted some prototype or some artist rendition rendering of what they were dreaming of and he goes and I'd add a latch here or a door or a window or something and he goes and then the engineers would call me back oh my god thank you for thinking that that was genius we would we we hadn't put that in our plans yet and he goes it was that at that moment I realized there's something that I can do that no one else can in the way that I can and if anything I mean I agree with Tanya I don't I mean sometimes when I'm even calling myself president of Explore Mars, it sounds preposterous to my ears. However, I realized in that moment and have so many times over the last many years is that there is a reason you are you, you little thermodynamic miracle, you know, one in 400 quadrillion possibilities that you would be you. So it's only you can bring to light in your own way, the science and the meaningful education and outreach that you can bring. So as the grandma, I believe, of this group is just go out there, go forth. And yes, the doubt will come, but you have, I feel like there's a certain sort of kind of mission to be in a woman in, a woman in space, a woman in space or a woman in science. It's like we were born at a time to encourage the next generation of women and ladies behind us to do more and go further. And so while it may not go away, go ahead and grab your big girl panties and say, yes, this is me and this is what I do. That's great. Thank you so much, Janet. Um, we're, we're at the end of the time. So I just wanted to leave everybody with a, a note about something else happening tonight in case you have time. Um, my dear friend, John Conafe, that I think most of, not most of you, I see a lot of people are probably familiar with him here, uh, is hosting... Uh, his weekly Emerald City Space Nerds Happy Hour, and they are having a panel on um, the privilege of working in the space industry and how we can't ignore uh, racism happening happening here on the ground just because we're working on stuff in space. Uh, it's going to be hosted by Dr. Cyan Proctor, um, and so I highly recommend that you check it out. I think it's going to be a very good and impactful conversation. Um, I'm posting the YouTube link in the chat right now. It's not up yet, but it starts at 9 p.m. Eastern time, so one hour from now, uh, and it will start live streaming on there. Um, and Sarah, do you want to talk about the slide you put up just now? Oh, you're uh, you're on mute, Sarah. There we go. Um, yeah, just a quick, um, I guess, quick thing that the, these webinars are free, um, but um, if if you are able to um, these are just some places um, that, um, suggestions for donations. Um, of course, um, if you've done your research and homework, there are other places that could really benefit too, but just some organizations that are uh, led by uh, Black folks or supporting the Black Lives Matters. Um, and just a quick note that if, uh, if, you had, um, if you had submitted an abstract to present at the conference that was canceled, or if you are a grad student that wants to talk about their research, the last Thursday of this month, our webinar would be, will, is going to focus on those talks. So send us an email if you would like to give a talk um, in that webinar. Great. Thanks, Sarah. And thanks again, everybody, so much for dialing in. Um, we will send out an email uh, and post on Twitter and other places when we're going to have the uh, dates and speakers for the next lineup. Uh, we will also probably have a, we will also probably have another meeting next week on advocacy and allyship in the space sector. Um, so stay tuned for information for that as well. And everybody have a good night and hope I, hopefully we'll see you over at the Emerald City Space Nerds uh, panel in an hour. Bye. Bye.